Well, I wanted to start this video by expressing my deep appreciation to Reverend Koi Umezu, who is one of the ministers at the West Los Angeles Buddhist Temple, where I am a formal member. And I appreciate her approach to the Dharma talks that she provides, as well as those of Reverend Takata, as well as after-service sessions that she conducts with both those who are there at the temple in person, as well as those of us who are tuning in, so to speak, using Zoom. And these Dharma Reflection sessions give her an opportunity to give us educative input about different aspects of Jodo Shinshu teaching, as well as then giving us the opportunity to interact with each other a bit and share our own reflections and feelings about different aspects of what she presents. I mention her at the top, particularly in this video, because if you stick through the entire thing, you will actually hear her reciting a letter from a Jodo Shinshu ancestor called Renyo Shonen, as well as reciting it in Japanese in a way that I find very attractive. In fact, I, I asked her, I said, Reverend Umezu, this that you recite using a very song-like or musical-like approach, I find to be extremely uh, lyrical, extremely haunting, if you will, uh, the kind of melody that sort of sticks with you, or at least has stuck with me and that I really appreciate. Honestly, I did not know at that time what the content was of what she was reciting slash singing. But, you know, she sent me a, a, an upload, a, a, an audio clip of her uh, doing this particular uh, song, if you will, or recitation, along with the copy of the uh, translation. So it educated me then on what she was actually sharing in terms of the content of this uh, that she had done a number of times, I believe, after her Dharma talks. So what I need to do at this point, and by the way, in addition to trying to upload that at the end of this video, I will upload it as a standalone video so that those of you who don't want to hear all my musings and jabberings don't need to, to listen to the end of, of this particular video. But in any case, what, what I want to do is back up then and talk about who was the author of this letter. Um, and his name, again, was Renyo, or Renyo Shonen, and he was known as the restorer of Shin Buddhism. He was a pivotal figure, and he was born into the Hanganji, Hanganji lineage. Now, that word, I think, is worthy of just a little bit of focus, uh, in that Hanganji uh, represents the name of, as I understand it, the home temple for Jodo Shinshu, or Shin Buddhism, in Kyoto, Japan. And what it means literally is, Temple of the Primal Vow. And of course, the whole essence of Shin Buddhism is to focus on the Primal Vow of Amida Buddha, the 18th vow of his 48 vows, the 18th of his 48 vows that he uh, articulated in the presence of the Buddha Lokasvara Raja, which formulate the essence of what we entrust in in order to feel our own sense of self assurance that we will be born in his pure land when we die. And by the way, if you are very interested in this, and I would encourage you if you have an interest in Shin Buddhism to follow up on it, I'll reference a book that I actually mentioned in my last musings. This one here that was published by uh, BVK America as part of their Tripitaka series. And not only does it include the Tani Show, which was Yenbo's description of the actual words of Shinran as he was trying to clarify very various deviations from the uh, true teaching, but it also includes Renyo's letters. And I mention that here because as I reviewed it this morning, in the, in the introduction to the letters section, they give an explanation of the, the terms that are used to translate the, the key term of Shinjin whether to be used as faith or as entrusting or what is the appropriate way to translate it. And they give some commentary on that. But anyway, there are two main branches of Jodo Shinshu, each with its own Hanganji or Hanganji temple. There's the Nishi Hanganji, which is the West Hanganji, and the Haigashi Hanganji, which is the East Hanganji. 
And these temples, of course, are major centers for Shin Buddhism and have a significant influence on Japanese culture and society. So back to Renyo. Renyo, again, was born into this Hanganji lineage. He actually became the eighth head priest. And the way they did this in Shin Buddhism or Jodo Shinshu is they did it, I think, based on um, sort of generational biological heritage, if you will. In other words, I think this was partly an attempt to avoid a competitive kind of vying for the top position within the Hanganji uh, through some kind of uh, process that could be destructive or negative to the to the health of the organization. And he was living in a time of great turmoil and upheaval. So Renyo faced significant challenges in preserving and spreading the teachings of Shinran, who again was the founder of Shin Buddhism. Despite facing persecution and the destruction of uh, the temple, he persevered. He was a charismatic leader, an effective communicator, and his teachings resonated with the people. His teachings played a crucial role in expanding Shin Buddhism throughout Japan, making it accessible to people from all walks of life. So that's my understanding, too, is that Shinran, he wrote an awful lot of things, and he really spelled out his interpretation of Buddhism in general and of the Pure Land tradition in particular. Uh, and certain elements from Shinran's writings can be pulled out and be seen as true gems of being able to communicate the essence of Shin Buddhism. And some of these, by the way, are actually in the Tani show that his follower Yenbo articulated from having heard him directly. But Ranyo kind of boiled it down to its essence and communicated it over and over and over to people in a way that really did help it spread throughout throughout Japan and, and beyond. So what he wrote is referred to as Gobunsho, or epistles. And what these were, were a collection of letters that he wrote. And by the way, he lived from 1415 to 1499. Now again, when he took over as the abbot of the Hanganji, he found it in a state of deterioration and stagnation. And according to this Google, artificial intelligence blurb that got spit out for me, I can share with you that he found it, again, in a state of deterioration and stagnation, and he immediately worked to change the state of things by going into aggressive evangelism and started reaching out to the common folk. Renyo Shonen started writing letters in simple Japanese to the various temples, families, and ordinary folk to clarify and propagate the true purpose of Namu Amida Butsu, the name or the Nembutsu, and also to clarify Shinran Shonen's teachings. As the letters were simple to understand, many ordinary folk then began to flock to the Hanganji in the thousands to seek deliverance through faith and to clarify doubts about the teachings. As a result, the Hanganji underwent a revival and the influence that followed still continues even today. So, these letters or epistles are broken down, as are many Buddhist writings and scriptures, into different fascicles. And this letter that, back to Reverend Amezu, that she was reciting or singing was from fascicle five, and within that fascicle it was letter number one. And I'll kind of read it to you myself here, sort of line by line, and you can hear what the content is. But as you can, as you can understand as I read it, is that this really communicates the essence of Shin Buddhism. And its title, if, if you want to put a title on it, which I'm not sure Renyo did or not, but here's the title that we have for this purpose. It's called uh, Matsudai Muchi Sho, which means those lacking wisdom in the latter age. And again, you'll recur the, recall that I had previously mentioned that Buddhism was conceived of as having various ages as a function of how far, how many years or hundreds of years had passed subsequent to the original historical Buddha, with the idea being that the further we are away from the original historical Buddha, the more watered down the teachings are, and therefore the harder they are to really understand and much less follow in terms of practices. So here, 
both Shinran as well as his contemporaries, such as Nishiren, thought that we were in the latter age, or what they called Mapo, at that time in the 13th century. And of course, if we were in the latter age then, we were certainly in the latter ages uh, when Renyo came about in terms of his lifetime. And so what Renyo says in this letter, he says, lay people in the latter age who lack wisdom should deeply rely on Amida Buddha wholeheartedly. So a key question, and this is an important question for each one of us is, how do we view ourselves? Like, do I think I, John, am capable of experientially understanding, quote unquote, in a way that's beyond my dualistic thinking mind, the true nature of prajna or wisdom or shunyata? Do I have that capability? I don't think so. I mean, I, I can have an intellectual understanding and I can communicate about it and I can appreciate the profundity of, te of scriptures or sutras like the Heart Sutra or the Diamond Sutra. But as far as really being able to have that wisdom or experiencing it, perhaps more than just simply in a, uh, a brief glimpse or sort of brief flash of lightning, it's impossible for me to do. Now, each of you, each of us has to answer that question for themselves in terms of, do I identify myself as a lay person in this latter age who lacks wisdom? That's the first question. If I do, then the implication is that I won't be able to attain enlightenment or nirvana or Buddhahood on the basis of my own self-effort, my own self-power practices. So the implication is then, what do I do? In other words, is, is there no other path for me within the Buddhist tradition? And the answer, of course, is of course there is another path. And that what Renyo is saying, that if we identify in that way, then we should, quote, deeply rely on Amida Buddha wholeheartedly, entrusting themselves to Buddha deeply and unwaveringly, unwaveringly for their emancipation. So that I have to, and I do, entrust in Amida Buddha. And what do I entrust in, of course, is what I entrust in is the power of his vow, his 18th vow and the power of that vow which gives me assurance that I am embraced and never to be forsaken and that I, without any risk of backsliding, can count on the fact that when I die I will be reborn in his pure land, at which point I will become a Buddha and can then manifest the kind of compassion that I can only think about intellectually in this life but cannot manifest in a full-fledged full way. So again, lay people in the latter age who lack wisdom should deeply rely on Amida Buddha wholeheartedly entrusting themselves. So here we have the word entrusting instead of having faith. And that frankly is the term that I prefer. Entrusting themselves to Buddha deeply and unwaveringly for their emancipation without turning their thoughts to other matters. Now, he recommended this and I don't want to quibble with Renyo Shonen, but part of whether or not we turn our thoughts to other matters may be a function of our karma. And mine is certainly such that I sometimes turn my thoughts to other matters, other matters like an appreciation for the broader Mahayana canon. But what I'm very cognizant of and, and what feels to me like the critical feature of my thoughts turning to other matters is that I I don't kid myself that my that I have the ability to engage in any of the practices associated with those other matters that would be of such significance that it would assist me in my attainment of the ultimate objective of becoming a Buddha. So, you know, they are of interest to me and both in terms of my own inherent interest as well as in terms of being able to communicate and pass along other Buddhist teachings other than Shin Buddhism to other people who may not be able to relate at this point to the faith-oriented, other power-oriented approach of Shin Buddhism. And then the letter goes on, however deep and heavy their karmic evil may be, Amida Tathagata unfailingly save them. And I'm not going to give you the details of all my dirty laundry, so to speak, but 
I do deeply feel that I have deep and heavy evil karma. Evil is a tricky word, and you know, Reverend Takata and Reverend Umezu have helped us to understand it uh, in perhaps a, a little more um, moderated tone, if you will. It doesn't mean that I've gone out and murdered people, you know, and uh, you know, I think that we all have to take a look at what our own past thoughts, behavior, etc., has been, and the extent to which we would view it as deviating from an ideal, the kind of ideal that's manifested in description, for example, of bodhisattvas in the various sutras. And I think what we would end up having to conclude, 99.9% .9 of us, is that we don't even come close to that kind of idealistic standard. So in that sense, the deviation from that perfectionistic idealistic standard is what in this context we would think of as deep and heavy evil karma karma being based on all the various past causes and conditions that have led me to be where I am sitting in front of this camera uh, talking to you right now. That Amita Tathagata unva unfailingly saves me and that's the, that's the faith, that's the faith that I have. And so in a separate paragraph, in a second paragraph, uh, Renyo says, this is the essence of the 18th vow that assures our birth in the pure land through, Nem through the Nembutsu. So again, the essence of the 18th vow is by virtue of this entrusting, which not insignificantly is a gift given to us from Amida, rather than even in itself anything that I am doing or can do to uh, create an opportunity for myself to attain that ultimate enlightenment. But the essence of the 18th vow is that even if my karma is heavy and deep, that I am still saved as a function of Amida's vow. So then in a separate paragraph, Renyo says, once our heart is thus settled, we should say the Nembutsu, whether awake or sleep, or as long as we live, humbly and respectfully, Renyo Shonen. So saying the Nembutsu, we know, is not a form of practice in Shin Buddhism. It is in some earlier forms of Pure Land Buddhism or other traditions within Buddhism. But for us, it's merely an expression of gratitude. So what I'm going to do is read this letter once again and then transition and shift gears to try to upload onto the end of this video Reverend Koi Omezu's recitation of this letter and her in English and her singing of it in Japanese. Namo Mina Boats. Lay people in the latter age who lack wisdom should deeply rely on Amida Buddha wholeheartedly, entrusting themselves to Buddha deeply and unwaveringly for their emancipation, without turning their thoughts to other matters. However deep and heavy their evil karma may be, Amida Tathagata unfailingly saves them. This is the essence of the 18th vow that assures our birth in the pure land through the Nembutsu. Once our heart is thus settled, we should say the Nembutsu, whether awake or sleep, or as long as we live. Namo Mita Bodhs. Namo Mita Bodhs. Namo Mita Lay people in the latter age who lack wisdom should deeply rely on Amida Buddha with singleness of heart, entrusting themselves to the Buddha single-mindedly and unwaveringly for their emancipation without turning their thoughts to other matters. However deep and heavy their evil karma may be, Amida Tathagata unfailingly saves them. This is the essence of the 18th vow that assures our birth in the Pure Land through the Nembutsu. Once our heart is thus settled, we should say the Nembutsu, whether awake or asleep, for as long as we live, humbly and respectfully. Sarani yo no kata e kokoro furazu, 
石にこにぶたすけたまえともさん、修行ば。たとえ在後は人獣なりとも、必ず皆如来は救いなしますべし。これすなわち第十八の伝聞の情のせがの心なり。かくのごとく賢女しての上には寝ても覚めても命のあらん限りは。生命念仏すべきものなり。あなかしこ、あなかしこ。ナモアミダブツ、ナマンダブツ、ナマンダブツ、ナマンダブツ、ナマンダブツ、ナマンダブツ、ナマンダブツ、ナマンダブツ、ナマンダブツ、ナマンダブツ、ナマンダブツ、ナマン